May the words of my mouth and thoughts of my heart be acceptable before you, O God, my Rock, my Redeemer. Shalom all and welcome. I am your host, Ariel Bart Sadok, and you find me online at koshertorah.com. I've titled this course, An Orthodox Rabbi Reads the Christian Bible. My purpose and intent in teaching this course is simple. I want to be able to explain why Torah Judaism and Torah faithful Jews do not and will not accept or embrace the teachings of the Christian religion. I have no intentions or desires in this course to attack the religion of Christianity. I am not here to challenge or critique those who embrace the Christian faith. I am not here to talk about Christianity at all. Even though due to the nature of this material, I am sure that I will not be able to avoid the topic entirely. Nevertheless, I am here to look at the Christian Bible from an entirely Torah point of view. I begin with certain premises. I do not deny the existence of an historical Yeshu, be he called Yeshua or what. For Torah faithful Jews, Yeshu was not, is not, and can never be the Messiah of Israel. For Torah faithful Jews, Yeshu was not, is not, and can never be God, or even a son of God, any more than any other human being of flesh and blood. For the record, the historical Yeshu was born, lived as, and died as a Jew. He and his original followers were all Jews who, like him, were born, lived as, and died as Jews. Absolutely none of them were Christians in any sense of the word. We, to our faithful Jews, follow the same religion that Yeshu himself practiced. We pray to the same Heavenly Father. We live by the same Torah, Mitzvot, and Mahasim Tovim. Yeshu was not a Christian, and neither are we. Yeshu's original followers were all Torah-observant Jews, as was he. As Jews, educated in Torah, drenched in its teachings, and from what can be seen, knowing no other spiritual path, I must logically conclude that the original writings of Yeshu's original followers were all Jewish writings, and therefore well within my domain as a Torah-observant rabbi to read them and understand them as would one rabbi to another. I therefore begin with the position that anything found in the Christian Bible attributed to any of its Jewish authors that does not agree with Torah Judaism must not have been written by such an author and is therefore subject to suspicion and must be critically analyzed. And that is what I am here to do. Like many Torah sages before me, I do not accept Talmudic Midrash about Yeshu at face value. Those teachings were meant to be polemic not historical. Therefore, they will not be part of our discussions. I've been led to perform this work because of the experiences in my personal life. As a teenager, I was victimized by a terrible evangelical group in my hometown on Long Island. This group was led by a very evil, lying, deceitful individual who turned out to also be a pedophile. I'm thankful that I was able to escape being victimized in that way. Nevertheless, this individual sought to clandestinely place his minions of Orthodox Yeshivot in Israel to get them to learn about Judaism with the attempt to make it easier for them to persuade Jews to convert and join their fold. I fought long and hard against this group and I'm proud of my contributions in thwarting their efforts. It was through them and the cause of them that I became exposed to Christianity and have therefore devoted the last 40 years of my life to study and investigation to discover whatever the truth that is still out there to be discovered. And now, after 40 years, I feel confident and ready to share my insights and discoveries with you. So again, I reiterate, I am not here to attack our God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian neighbors. I hold them in the highest esteem and respect. I am here to explain to you, to them, and all willing to listen, what we Torah faithful Jews see when we read the Christian Bible, and why we see what we do. And now, let us proceed with tonight's lesson. We'll proceed now into class 13, lesson 13. I want to finish up something in the end of chapter 16, and then go on through chapter 17 and beyond. Now, the section here that I'm going to begin with, we actually began last week. I want to go back over it. Verse 21. It says that Yeshu, it says here, began to show his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and raised again on the third day. Okay. We made mention of this last week. Let's review it again now. Number one. 
from a Christian point of view, obviously, this is prophecy for their entire theological fulfillment. I get that. But from a historical and realistic point of view, one of two things is true here. Number one, either Matthew did not actually write these historical words, and they were put into a text by a later author, kind of like after the fact, or... Indeed, maybe Yeshu did say this, or Matthew did record it. And there's much more going on here than meets the eye. Now, what is going on here is something that is very ancient in belief, literally dating back almost to the time of Yeshu himself. And that is what's become to, come to be known as the Passover plot. That indeed, Yeshu did not die on the cross it was all a hoax it was all a setup. many of the original Nazarene and Ebionite followers of Yeshu that's the historical church of Jerusalem led by James and all that allegedly were in on this <clears throat> and that even though James led the in quote group after Yeshu's passing allegedly Yeshu was still there still alive in hiding awaiting for the time to reappear as the in quote resurrected Messiah now these controversial and Christian eye ideas are nothing new you have books written in modern times about maybe 40 years ago a well, actually a lot longer than that I guess um, a British professor by the name of Hugh Schoenfeld wrote a book called The Passover Plot uh, outlines his entire ideas and beliefs about these things. But he is not alone in this. You can read Biaget and Lee, the guys who wrote the uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail books. That's about like the bloodline of Yeshu that gave rise to Dan Brown's uh, The Da Vinci Code's uh, philosophy. This is all about the Priory, the Zion kind of people. Well, there it is believed too. <clears throat> that again, this plan of this crucifixion was all staged a staged event specifically and intentionally to catapult the issue out of being just a regular political firebrand like all those who've come before him and after him to set him aside to being supernatural now these ideas as opposed to being presented in modern literature and in the previous class, I discussed something called the Jesus Scroll. Not going to get into that right now, but you go back into the previous class, and that's a very radical and controversial uh, belief system there about a book that's very hard to find these days. But these original Asbionite and Nazarene teachings, as I said, date way back, so far back, that the stories about Yeshu that are recorded in the Quran, which you remember is the Bible of Islam, so that's putting us way back into the 6th, 7th centuries, state that Yeshu did not die on the cross. So where did the Quran get that idea from? Obviously, not by reading modern day books, but because these ideas were around from a long time ago. Needless to say, modern Christianity will consider this heresy. Sorry, but these are the ideas and the beliefs that have been around there forever. Modern Christianity considers the uh, popular uh, belief that's all over the internet now about Yeshu having a wife. Well, whether or not he sired uh, a bloodline that led to the Merovingians and the secret leaders of Europe, as uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail said, eh, you know something? The Priory, the Priory, 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 Priory de Sion. They are who they are. And yeah, they're real out there. You know, I've met some of them, but whatever. And um, I'm not convinced. But to think that Yeshu wouldn't have been married and lived a celibate life actually contradicts Christian theology. He had to be married in order to have been, in quote, the perfect sacrifice because being married is one of the laws. But even though it's not necessarily in our section of scripture here, it's something that we should know. So then, 
when the controversial statement arise, was Yeshu married? A Christian will say, no, no, can't be, can't be. But from a Jewish point of view, the answer must always be, but of course, he had to be. What else? What else? Moving right along. Now, Peter, all right, says here, Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Peter rebuked his Rebbe? That's pretty strong language. And he goes, Be it far from thee, O Lord, that this shall happen to thee. Peter, his right-hand man, his bodyguard, says, Oh, no, 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 we're not going to let that happen. What does Yeshu say? Get thee behind me, Satan! Thou art an offense unto me! For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. He just called Peter Satan? That's not nice. Obviously, it's not literal. It's metaphorical. Yeshu does have a tongue. He's got, he's, got a, he's got a way to him. I mean, in the last class, we learned how he referred to a innocent Gentile woman called her a dog. And here he's calling his, his right-hand man Satan. Wow, that's, that's pretty harsh. But understand the context. If indeed Yeshu has this plan then indeed, for Peter to get in the way is a problem. You see, if Yeshu is really this radical, extremist revolutionary plotting an insurrection against Rome, and in order to accomplish this, has to create a persona for himself as being some kind of bigger-than-life supernatural leader so as to convince people to follow him, well, if you are creating this conspiracy the best thing in the world is to keep your bigger mouth shut and only involve people on a need to know basis so indeed Peter would not have been involved Yeshu would have only involved those who were necessary and let everybody else act accordingly so as to put on a good show but now listen to what he says here verse 24 through 28 Yeshu says to his disciples if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now remember, this was said prior to the crucifixion. Crucifixion. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Aside from Yeshu, how many Jews were ever crucified? Anybody ever stop to ask the question? The answer in history would be no one knows because the numbers were in the thousands. Maybe even tens of thousands. Romans were notorious for crucifying, especially throughout Israel. And it goes back a long way. I mean, literally for a hundred years before the issue, people were crucified in large numbers. The cross was originally a sign of of Jewish martyrdom. If you were to say, I will stand up against the ruthless repression of Rome, the response would be, pick up the cross. I am not afraid of Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name. I am not afraid of self-sacrifice. I will therefore act appropriately according to Torah, and willingly sacrifice myself to death. That was the meaning of pick up the cross and follow me. Yes, the cross was originally a sign of Jewish martyrdom before it ever became a sign of the Christian religion. And indeed, remember, for centuries, if I'm not mistaken, still used to this very day, the original sign of the Christian church was the symbol of the fish, the ichthus, which was the Greek term for, I think it was Jesus Christ, God's Son and Savior. I think that's like the capital letters, what it stood. It was a code, a secret code. And only centuries later did they pick up the cross as its symbol after it had its original meaning and message of self-sacrifice for Jews was long forgotten in history. 
So Yeshu's message is sacrifice. The typical zealot call. Rise up, follow me to death, boys. All right? Now, there's a very interesting little tidbit of military history. For those of you who are familiar, most generals and command officers lead their soldiers from behind. All right? They stay back behind the lines and they send the other guys up to fight and die. Well, there's another way of fighting. Those who lead the fight. Where in which you had leaders literally march their men into battle. What happens? You die. Sacrifice. This is considered a great thing. To die in sacrifice for God. Whether it be in dying in the battle or whatever. Yeshu isn't saying to people, sacrifice your souls or your sinners. No, he's saying, being that we're going to have an insurrection against Rome, and Rome is heavily armed, and Rome is viciously and ruthlessly violent, there's going to be a very bloody war and people are going to die. And if you're not willing to sacrifice yourself for the cause, for whoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever will lose his life for my sake, it says, we shall find it. Yeshua is saying, throw yourselves on the swords to prepare the way for the kingdom. Again, these are words of extremist insurrection to get people ready for martyrdom. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? All right? It says here, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Well, that's the Christian hope and faith that they believe for to this very day. The Son of Man again, if let's just let's just say for argument's sake, Yeshu is saying these words. Let's not get overly scholarly and question whether Matthew wrote them or not. Let's put the words in Yeshu's mouth, right or wrong, and respond accordingly. Yeshu refers to himself as the Son of Man. He's clearly applying to himself a messianic mode, which in the context of everything that he's been saying and doing makes sense. And he says, I'm going to come in the glory of God. Angels at my side. Angels, whether that's supernatural beings from another planet or dimension, or a reference to the Essenes, who are also called the angels. Remember, there are thousands of them all throughout the country. All right? And then he shall reward every man according to his works. In other words, if you help the insurrection and the overthrow of the government, then indeed you will be rewarded. But if you sit by the wayside, poo to you. Now, isn't this speaking of what Christians call the second coming? Isn't this referring to the time to come? Well, I ask, let's read the next verse. Yeshu continues in the same breath and he says, Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That means amongst his immediate disciples, his Talmidim, his students, he's saying, some of you are going to die in the war, but some of you will live. Some of you will make it. Some of you will see. Well, again, let's put these words into Yeshu's mouth, put it into the 30s and 40s of the common era. Unless you got somebody who was alive when Yeshu was around then, who would now be over 1900 years old, I guess Yeshu was wrong. Oh my goodness, how can I say that? But I didn't say that. These are Yeshu's words. So aside from creating fantasy, myth, and legend, apparently it is clear Yeshu is speaking to people about an immediate, an urgent, and an imminent war to come. The people there would be alive to live through it. He's not talking about some future time, 1900 years in the future. Who are amongst the people who were alive in the first century were there today. Don't give me fantasy. Don't tell me legends and stories, please. Okay? You clearly see from this verse alone 
the vindication, the validation of what Yeshu is militarily planning. Now, let's move into something very interesting. It says here, chapter 17, After six days, Yeshu takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up to a high mountain apart. Now, they're up on top of the mountain, just the four of them. These three guys and Yeshu. What are they doing up on the mountain? It says here, And he, meaning Yeshu, was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And behold, there appeared to him Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, Eliyahu and Avi. They're all chit-chatting. Hey, man, what's going on? Oh, fine, cool, whatever. And then Peter asks and says to Yeshua, he says, Lord, probably it means Rebbe in, in the original. Maybe uh, is it good for us to be here? If you will, let us make some tabernacles, Sukkot. One for you, one for Moshe, one for Eliyahu. Sukkot? What do they need Sukkot for? That's a curious statement. Let's say, all right, if we're going to visualize this as, as the myth here is being portrayed, Yeshu turns into a being of light. And all of a sudden, these two other beings of light pop up. Let me ask you this. If you saw a being of light popping up in your driveway, would you go out and say, hey, you want me to build for you a sukkah? Hey, you want me to build for you a, a little place to hang out? You want to come in and have a cup of coffee? I don't know about you. Maybe I'm weird. But if I see beings of light hanging around, flitting around and all the rest, the last thing in the world that I'm asking them is if I can build them a hotel room for the night. Something strange about Peter's statement. Hmm. But let's move on. While he spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadows them. Behold, a voice out of the cloud that says, This is my beloved Son. My version has the Son capitalized, capital S. Again. Okay, good. In whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Okay. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces, and they were sore afraid. That's pretty slick. Let me ask you a question. Did this really happen? Was this an actual, literal, physical event? Well, let's see what Matthew has to say about it. It says, Yeshu came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. Is Yeshu still glowing? Is he still twinkling? Is Moshe and Eliyahu still hanging around over there? How did they even know it was Moshe and Eliyahu? Were they wearing name tags? Right? I mean, how do you know these things? But it says, when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Yeshu only. And as they came down from the mountain, Yeshu charged them, saying, Listen to this. Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. All right? I don't know this risen from the dead stuff. Maybe that's, you know, historical. Maybe it's not. In other words, that's the original words from Matthew or not. But Yeshu clearly states that this was a vision. It never really happened. Now things are starting to make sense to me. Because if it was legitimate and real and historical and actual and physical, why would Peter be offering to make them Sukkot? That is symbolic kind of talk. The kind of symbolisms that occur in a vision. But remember something about a vision. Visions are like dreams. And in a dream or in a vision, your mind is acting with active imagination, sometimes even a hallucinogenic effect, to see things, perceive things, and interact with things in the context within, not necessarily that which is without meaning in the physical world. Yeshua himself said this is a vision. So therefore, whoop, you hear that? That is our buzzer going off, warning us that we got a storm coming in here. It's the one thing I forgot to turn off, so I apologize for you. So, hey, look at the good news, right? 
if and when in the middle of this class you hear a big explosion or something like that, that means a tornado hit my house. And with any luck whatsoever, next stop, Oz. Right? I hear they got a really cool wizard up there in a big, long, yellow brick road. I've been long meaning to follow that for a long time. I got my three dogs. I don't know how they're going to get along with Toto up there, but eh, we'll figure it out when we get up there. Just in case that happens. But if it doesn't, oh well. Getting back here to visions. <laughs> looks like looks like whatever day we smoke it up there in the mountains, maybe some of that floated in here. <laughs> Going off to Oz. Maybe that's exactly what Peter, James, and John did. Maybe they were off to see the wizard. Think about it, for real. Did Yeshu give them something? Did they ingest some magic mushrooms or smoke something? Remember, hashish was very common in, in the culture in those days. Just like it is today in the, in the Middle East. Now, that part is left out of our little story here. But clearly, from Peter's description, he is having a vision of an archetypal, non-physical nature, which indicates some type of altered consciousness, which may very well have been induced by some chemical substance. The text does not say that, but the nature of the description of what is seen indicates it. Maybe like an old, ancient version of LSD. Think about it. Because this is what Yeshu says. Don't tell anybody what you saw. Why not? Good gosh, if he's so supernatural, would you want everybody to know? Well, if everybody knew, in those days, people were not dumb. They knew about this meditative, hallucinogenic stuff, just like we do today. Too many people that have asked the exact same questions that I am asking now. And they might have drawn conclusions and answers then that Yeshu might not have liked. So therefore, he solidified his supernatural place with his three top guys who are going to go out there and spread the word. And that's what he needed them to do. So now, moving right along, his disciples asked him and said, Okay, look, if you are going to be the Mashiach, right? Doesn't it say, it says the scribes say, right? The rabbis say, the Bible says, Eliyahu and Abi has to come before you. So, Yeshu says to him, Eliyahu truly shall come first and restore all things. Restore all things? Well, I get that from the book of Malachi. You know, behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. But who has restored all things? Well, John the Baptist did not do that, now did he? Well, we're going to learn more about Johnny right here. He says, But I say to you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not. But I have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer of them. The disciples understood he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist was Eliyahu Anabi. Well then... Again, for the third time now, we have reincarnation in the Christian Bible. Remember, Eliyahu and Abi, Elijah the prophet, was born. He had a mama and a daddy, at least that's the way we believe it. And then he went up to heaven, never dying. But John the Baptist, according to the book of Luke, was born. He had a mama, and he had a daddy, and he was a little baby. And if that's the case... Then the soul of Elijah that was up in heaven came back and was born again as a baby. No way around it. That's reincarnation. A lot of people don't like that, but hey, I didn't write this stuff. I'm only reading what it says. Take a little sip here. Ah, good stuff. Moving right along. It says here, and when they come to the multitude, there comes to him a certain man kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic. She whiz. <laughs> Just his son? How many of us have kids who are lunatics? He says, he's sorely vexed. For oft time he falls into fire and oft into water. So he's got a real destructive thing going on inside of me. The kid's suicidal. And I brought him here to your disciples and they couldn't cure him. So, what does Yeshu say? This is a very interesting little story here. Pay attention. Yeshu says, Oh, you faithless, perverse generation, 
How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. In other words, Yeshu is angry that his Talmidim are not able to cure this guy. Now remember, as we've discussed in previous classes, the vast majority of, in quote, demonic possessions at this time were mostly what we would today call psychological problems. There were most likely some real significant deep aberration psychiatric problems. And, yes, religion and even exorcisms perform placebo effects that have verifiable psychiatric and psychological therapeutic effect. I have worked with psychiatrists and psychologists in these endeavors with people who are not really possessed by devils but think they are. And because we go through the rituals, they think that they are as healed as they were sick and it works therapeutically. Cool and groovy. The issue is ticked off that his guys can't handle this, this devil. Right? So it says, Yeshu rebukes the devil, and they part out of him. The child is cured from that very hour. If and when there's a psychological aberration, as opposed to an actual and a real presence within, then you can rebuke it, and then you can actually work for psychiatric and psychological cleansing and healing. If you have a real entity within you, you don't rebuke it and kick it out, because it's, you know... The, di the, the difference would be, for example, if and when you are a martial artist and you punch wooden boards, you can break the wooden board. And that looks pretty impressive, right? But when you try to hit somebody as opposed to a wooden board, what's the difference? The person hits you back as opposed to the wooden board. Right? Boards don't hit back. So psychologically... If somebody's got some, in quote, psychiatric problem, you can deal with that in one way. Whereas if you have a real actual entity within, it's very different. You have to work to heal the entity. You can't manhandle it. It's not a board of wood that'll just crack and break. It will hit you back. So, it says here then, Then came the disciples to Yeshua apart and said, Hey, how come we couldn't do this? How come you could and Yeshu again says, because of your unbelief. All right? Again, he chides them. And here he says something very interesting. Verily I say to you, if you have faith the size as a grain of a mustard seed, meaning the smallest amount, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So Yeshu is saying, if your faith is big enough, you can become a Jedi master. You can be like Master Yoda in Star Wars. Put forth your hand, have that beautiful John Williams music playing in the background. Do, 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 do. And all of a sudden things are raising, you're levitating them and moving them from right to left and left and right. Boy, oh boy, would it not be a nice sound and light show to watch. As you said it, I have never seen this day anybody levitate a mountain. Now, I've seen people using the bioelectric energy of the body, called qi in Chinese. I've seen them do some pretty slick stuff. And faith, that's the conviction of the power of mind. Oh yeah, I've seen it. For real, my own eyes, I know it can be done. Though I've never seen anybody levitate a mountain. And yet, I can see Yeshu turning this episode into a lesson about faith. Okay? But now listen to what he says next. How about, how bait? This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. He says, oh, you have little faith. How come you can't heal these, these entities? What's wrong with you? Oh yeah, by the way, these entities, this one's a real toughie. They don't come about by just uh, chat and talk. This one you have to pray and fast. Now, that sounds like a real type of an exorcism. Prayer, fasting, working with the soul, trying to heal it. You can read in modern works, like Rabbi Yehuda Fatiha's Minchat Yehuda, 
about the way and nature of how to do an exorcism. About how you gather people together, you blow the shofar, you say prayers, and the like. So, Yeshu himself is contradicting himself. Oh, ye of little faith. And yet it says you need prayer and fasting. Well, apparently he wasn't praying and fasting. He went and rebuked it. But he acknowledges that sometimes you need to do something more. That's a very interesting revelation that he had the type of insight into these things that only these the kind of rebbies who would do this stuff would know. Alrighty. Moving right along. Now we get back to the whole issue of the Passover plot. Yeshu says, And while they abode in the Galilee, Yeshu says to them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and the third day he shall raise again. And they were exceeding sorry. Strange. Weird. Now again, a Christian reader who accepts this as gospel truth just accepts it. But when we read this, especially in light of everything that we've been saying, Yeshu is readying his followers. He wants them to see him dead and buried so that they will equally see him in, quote, resurrected. Think about this. If you had a modern-day Rebbe, choose any one of the extremist rabbis in Israel or anywhere else. And he says, I am going to be the Mashiach. You and I are both going to roll our eyes and said, another nut job. Well, that's pretty much what they said 2,000 years ago, too. So, if the nut job of today wants to somehow convince people, what would he have to do? Well, If he could portray himself, set himself up as if he is martyred for the cause, he gets himself shot, blown up on public TV. Everybody sees him doing a Hollywood-style death scene. Eh, 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 Dead. Everybody knows it. And then they go to his funeral. Or they go to his tomb. And it's open. And then the rumors start flying. Like jet rockets around the world. He's not in his grave. We all know he died. Wink, wink. Now he's not dead. Think about what that would do. Think about what people would say. Think about how people would react. Now, we could contrive and make something up like that today, and according to the old legends, that's what Yeshua was doing. And indeed, judging from all these little tidbits, maybe that is exactly what he did. But now we're going to come to something else. Again, this, the, the, the narration of the text is jumping around from this to that to that to this, back and forth and forth and back to all different things. I'm not here to analyze all of this. I'm just here to read it. So let's move on. It says, They came into Kafarnahum, Capernaum. And there they, they that received tribute money, the tax collectors, the IRS of the day, they came to Peter and they say, hey, does not your master pay tribute? In other words, aren't you subject to taxation? Oh, how do you respond to that? Here in the United States today, we have people who are very anti-government. They are anti-taxation. They don't believe that they should be paying any taxes to the federal government whatsoever. So, in a make-believe scenario, emphasize make-believe, have one of these people approached by the tax man, the IRS. They get a letter from the IRS. You owe back taxes. They're going to send the letter back saying, we don't owe anything. We are free, independent, sovereign citizens. We don't owe you anything. We don't pay money to the government. How dare you even think that we would owe you. We are patriots. We are this and that. And you could go to blazes. Okay. For any of you who are in the United States, any of you who have ever had a run-in with the Internal Revenue Service, can you imagine if they sent you a letter, you owe us taxes, and you sent them back a response like that? What would happen? Probably 
one, one of the a couple of things. A, the IRS would send you back a letter apologizing and acknowledging your, your sovereign rights. Uh, you might have to be smoking some stuff that they had up there on the mountain in order to get that one. Or B, SWAT teams would show up, the police would show up, the FBI would show up, you'd lose everything and they'd throw you in a, in a pit or a jail cell and you'd stay there the rest of your life. That's probably more like it. Well, nothing's changed. Nothing new under the sun. Remember, Yeshu is not this unknown person. He grew up, he was a worker, apparently is what they said, a carpenter. So therefore, he was in some way a citizen and therefore subject to taxation. And they ask Peter, all right, you know, what are you doing? Peter says, yeah. So he comes to the house. Yeshu prevents him saying, what are you thinking, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Again, Yeshu turns this whole issue into a moral message. Peter says, well, they take them from strangers. So Yeshu says, then the children are free. He says, if we are strangers or we are children, which are we? Ah, uh, yes, we're strangers, and therefore we got to pay the tax. So Yeshu says, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go down to the sea, cast the hook, take up the fish that comes to your, comes up, and open up its mouth, and you're going to find money in there, take it, give it to them for me and you. Lest we offend them? Isn't this the radical leader who wants to create an insurrection and overthrow the government? Yeah. But anybody who's trying to do that, the last thing in the world they're going to try to do is bring attention to themselves before the time. Like the old saying, pick your battles. So bottom line, Yeshu here is saying, we got to pay the tax. He's saying that. We don't want to offend them. We don't want to upset the government. You got to pay the tax. Yeshu, I guess, would not have declared himself a sovereign citizen. He would have paid the tax. And apparently that's what he did. Whether they actually found the fish with money in his mouth, it sounds like an old story from the Talmud about one of Yosef Machir Shabbat, for those of you familiar with the story, about a guy who went out, got a fish, opened up its mouth and found a great pearl in it. Uh, these, these are the kinds of stories that were told in Mishnayak Talmudic times. So, to hear this story here, and, of course, know a similar story to it in the Talmud, makes it sound all the more so legendary than historical. But that's okay. Again, when we're telling a good story, why bother making distinctions between what's real and what's not? That, you know, messes up the flow of the story. But what I see here is that Yeshu clearly told Peter, don't offend the tax man, pay the tax. And that's exactly what they did. Where the money came from, leave it for the storytellers. But isn't that an interesting lesson? He chose not to stand up and fight. He chose not to make a stand or against the government. He laid low. Hmm. Interesting. Now, chapter 18. It says, at the same time, the disciples come to Yeshu saying, Who is the greatest? in the kingdom of heaven. Again, flipping to a completely different subject. And Yeshu calls a little child and says, set him in the midst, verily I say, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receive it to me. Okay. Innocence and simplicity of a child. That is called emunah tamima. Simple, pure faith. Now, what is this reference to a child all about? Because in all due respect, what kind of faith does a child have? If you were to ask a child about the the ideas and the beliefs of their faith, in other words, give them a theology test, they wouldn't know one thing from the other. But the one thing a child does know, a child knows how to follow instructions. A child knows how to listen. 
When you go and instruct a child and the child believes you, let's say it's your child and you're the parent, the child doesn't ask for details. The child doesn't sit to rationalize, intellectualize, philosophize, and rationalize its way out of doing it. No. It wants to please mommy or daddy, and therefore does what mommy and daddy say. So Yeshua is saying here, you need that kind of simplicity, that kind of obedience, childlike obedience. Why? Because Yeshu is setting up the mentality, the mindset of an army that's going to throw itself on the spears of its enemy. He's setting up his martyr brigade. Those who are going to go out and die for the cause. And this requires the faith of a child. The simplicity. This is what he's telling them. And indeed, this is how he would have been understood. That's what's most important. And he says here, Who shall shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me? I have my martyrs. I have my followers who are ready to throw themselves on the spears of the enemies for me. And if you are to offend one of them, you're going to challenge their faith, you're going to question them, you're going to say, what on earth are you doing? Why are you such a radical extremist, such a point of martyrdom? Jesus says it would be better for him than have a millstone or hanged around his neck, and that he be drowned in the depth of the sea not exactly a very nice thing to do, but Yeshu is again the man of mastering words here, and again he's threatening people yes, this is a threat you mess with my followers, those people who I am training for martyrdom you wait and see what's going to happen to you interesting choice of words here millstone hanging around their neck, drowned in the depth of the sea interesting, that when Martin Luther, the founder of Protestantism, he originally thought that his protestant movement would make it clear and simple to the Jews why they needed to convert to Christianity. Well, needless to say, the Jews didn't see things as good old Mr. Martin Luther would have wanted. He then converted and became one of the most rabid, Jew-hating anti-Semites in world history. And he is quoted in his books as saying, rather than convert a Jew, he would rather tie a millstone or hanging around his neck and then drown them in the depths of the sea. That was the venom and the hatred of Mr. Luther. So you see, this type of talk is very dangerous. Now, we're talking about a difference in time of 1500 years but Martin Luther picked up these words and his words were copied by anti-Semites after him for the last 500 years, used even by the Nazis watch what we say so now the issue continues woe unto the world because of the offenses for it must needs be that offenses come but woe to the man by whom the offenses come Wherefore, if thy hand, or if thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. It would be better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. All right? Yeshu is telling people to what? Self-mutilate themselves? Is this in any way real, uh, 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 literal? How many, how many Christians, first century time to modern times, self-mutilate themselves? I've never heard of a single example. I've never heard of anybody chopping off their hand because they can't keep their hands away from the candy dish. I've never seen anybody poking out their eyes because they can't keep their eyes off a pretty girl walking by. Or anything of the kind. 
But notice the extremism in this type of language. Notice the context. Yeshu is firing up here against those who would want his shock troop martyrs to think twice about what they are doing. No, they cannot. They have to have the faith of a child. And if you mess with them, we're going to put a millstone around your neck. How dare you? Continuing. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say to you, that in heaven, the angels do always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. And then he gets all messianic now. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. Again, the concept of a military action to restore the lost monarchy. Just like we've been reading all through this entire book here. You see it echoing through everything. And he says, continuing, How think thee, if a man have a hundred sheep, one of them have gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety-nine and go after the mountains and seek at the one that is astray? And if so, that he find it. Verily I say, he rejoices more in that sheep than in the ninety-nine that went not astray. So even so, that it's not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little sheep should perish. In other words, Yeshua is saying, I'm going after all the lost souls. I'm bringing them back to simplicity. Bringing them back to his version of Torah. Good gosh. He sounds with his outreach here like a modern day Lubavitcher. Always trying to reach out to everybody. But in all due respect to Lubavitch, which in my opinion, though they're very different from my approach of Judaism, uh, they still, in my opinion at least, are doing very positive work, reaching out to many around the world. And yet, for Lubavitch, the real way is to convert somebody and make them a Lubavitcher like them. That is their version of success. Okay, whatever. Yeshu is no different. Both were pretty much of the same mentality. Maybe that's why both Lubavitchers and, and, and Yeshu followers all believe in the coming of a resurrected Messiah. I don't know. but Not going to go there. don't mean to offend anybody, so let's move on. Okay. So again, Yeshu is talking here. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he hear thee, then thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or more, or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. They didn't have church in Yeshua's day. Okay? But if he neglect to hear the church, then let him be like a heathen, let him be like a Gentile. Oh, again, here's this Gentile, you know, anti-Gentilism. Or like a publican, like a Roman. Most people don't know what Yeshua is saying here is a very common and typical halakha, which is still observed to this very day. If and when there is a problem between party A and party B, and you try to make shalom, peace with party A, and he's not going to listen to you, to this day halakha says, go with one or two other people and try to appease him. And if you try once and you try twice and he cannot be appeased, Well, then the sin is his, and you have done your best. And here Yeshua is saying, uh, you know, ostracize that person. They're not willing to forgive you, ostracize them. Treat them like you will allow me a goy. Now, that to me means something very different to our Yeshua. Yeshua means that in a very racist and a derogatory way. Not the way anybody should treat anybody else, regardless of who and what they are. But again, you see echoed in Yeshua's words here, using a very common halachic procedure, which many Christians might use today, without even recognizing its Judaic origins. But those of us who have insights into Torah, recognize Yeshua again is speaking like a typical Pharisee of the day. Moving right along. Yeshua continues, he says, Verily I say to you, Whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whosoever shall ye loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Well, that means the followers of Yeshu 
They are the ones who decide what is allowed on heaven and on earth. It's a dramatic pause here to give you, yeah, that sounds Christian, right? But do you recognize what Yeshu just said here? Most of you don't have a clue. But I'm going to tell you, he just validated rabbinic authority. Because this is exactly what the rabbis say, based upon the verse in the book of Deuteronomy, where in which it says, when there be a question of law, you shall go unto the judge who shall be in those days, and what they say to you, thou shalt do. Do not depart from the right or the left, but follow their words. This is the exact foundation of rabbinic authority. The rabbis today, and since Mishnaic times, they're the ones who bind things on heaven. They're the ones who bind things on earth. And that is what we today call rabbinic authority. Why we call modern Torah Judaism rabbinic Judaism. The rabbis, in their very keen wisdom and insight, created the entire hedge around the Torah, which we call the fence. And this is what binds things on earth. And again, this is what is considered obligatory now in heaven. So, as rabbis, when we study law, we very distinct and clearly make differences between rabbinic law and Torah law. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which you don't have to get into right now. But clearly, we are obligated by the Torah of the rabbis. And again, Yeshu himself does say this exact same thing, Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3. Again, I quote, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Those are his words. Why? Because what they bind on earth is bound in heaven, and what they loose on earth is loose in heaven, or accepted. This is rabbinic authority. Yeshua was saying it, we should know and understand it ourselves. So again, he says, that if the two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. When two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. If anybody's ever read or learned anything or rabbinic notes, rabbis express opinions. Rabbi A says this, Rabbi B says that. Well, what then do we do? What is the road to follow? It all depends. Majority rules. The robe, the majority. So therefore, if you have two or three rabbis who have agreement against the one, well, that's the path we follow. That becomes called the halacha, the way that we follow. Yeshu is echoing the same sentiment. And again, I find this interesting, verse 20, which says, With two or three gathered in my name, all right, whether the words in my name were really there or not, it says, There I am in the midst of thee. That reminds me so much of what says in... Pirkei Avot, the words of the sages, the words of our fathers, where it says if two or three are gathered together studying Torah, that the divine presence is there. Wow. Yeshu is echoing the words of our sages. Of course, it might have been changed from its original form in Avot, but what would we expect? Anyway, I see we're kind of running short on time, so rather than get into a separate topic as we continue we'll pick up I guess with verse 21 for lesson 14 and again I see that if we look constantly and continually we can see a thread running through all of these teachings here which clearly validate for us the image of Yeshu being this radical extremist political agitator who indeed is out to make something happen right then and there. And that is exactly what our sages said about Yeshu and what and how we see things. Alrighty, I'm out of time. So on that note, let's conclude. I want to thank you again all for joining me tonight. I'm your host, Ariel Bart Sadok. I uh, hope that I'll see you in our future classes here at koshatora.com. Thanks for being here. God bless. Good night. Shalom.